we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Please accept my love, sloth. That is the Dragon Warrior, everybody. All right, some of y'all are vastly confused. That's all right. I'd like to tell you that my preaching will solve that. It may not. All right. An early evolution in gaming was the role of uh, role-playing games. Role-playing games changed video games. The first thing you would do in these games is what? You would name your character. Right. And you saw that in the video. What did they choose to name their character? Sloth. Sloth. It's, a, it's a good name for a boy or a girl. Goonies references. All right. Dragon Warrior was one of the first games to do this. It is done often in video games. You, you take your maid character on a quest, and in the quest, they grow in strength 
and in ability. All right, right, you understand this? You ever play a game like that? There's lots of games like this. These games are great. They're very engrossing. They take a lot of time. You get obsessed a little bit with them. When I was in school, I could not wait to get back and take my Dragon Warrior to the next level. Like, I'm only a few experience points away from leveling up. Like, seriously, I didn't go on any dates. All right. (laughs) These games uh, are, are just fantastic. These games are very popular. Right. But there is a mistake you can make that can be somewhat irksome and frustrating. The first thing you do is enter your name for your character, which ought to be a simple task, but not for an eight-year-old distracted boy. Yeah. I'm like distracted everywhere. All right. I remember once naming a character of mine wrong. I must not have been paying attention. Instead of C-H-R-I-S, I named him C-H-I-R-S. That's right. Everyone say it with me. Churse. Churse. Yeah. For the rest of the game, I was churse. (laughs) I couldn't change it. Once you're named, you're always named. That's usually how these games work. So if you're if your name is wrong, it's just too bad. You'll, you will walk into a village and speak to the villagers, and they will say, Oh, brave Churse, please save us from the Dark Lord. And I'm like, My name's Chris. And then you, you beat the game, and the king would say, Well done, Sir Churse. Here is my beautiful daughter. I'm like, Oh, I beat the game, but no, I didn't beat the game. Churse did. On Dragon Warrior, every time you fought, it would say Churse attacks, dealing seven damage points to the slime creature. What was a great game became kind of lame when you didn't get your name right. Perhaps even worse than this, maybe you can, if you didn't relate to that, maybe you can relate to this. It's what could happen in an arcade game when you got the high score. Young people, do you know about the high score? Do you know what the high score is? Wave your hand if you know what I'm talking about when I say the high score. All right, I'm preaching to somebody. All right. You played games like Pac-Man. You have heard of Pac-Man? Yeah. No, they have not heard of Pac-Man. Oh, Lord, pray for us. All right. Pac-Man, Galaga, Frogger, Donkey Kong. You played those games to do what? To get the high score. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they had a list of the high scores saved on the machine. And you tried to make that list so that you could write your initials by your score. Yes, this is what we did before 1990, kids. This is what we did. All right. For some reason, I could always get a high score. Maybe I just went to bad video games that no one good played at. But for whatever reason, I could usually get on the high score list. But I always had trouble putting in my initials. The struggle is real, all right? To be honest, sometimes those driving games, it was really hard to control, and just those motor skills just weren't fine-tuned there. They, but honestly, they gave you like 10 seconds to put your initials in because they want somebody to put a new quarter in. They only give you 10 seconds. You spent $10 getting this high score. Now they can't give you 20 seconds to put in your initials. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still bitter. I'm working out these these feelings. And I would always mess up in the hurry. My initials are CCF. It's actually CCWF, but they only give you three spaces. So I was always going to go with CCF, Christopher Clyde Fluitt. And somehow I'd always get it wrong. CCE has some high scores floating out there. CCC, I don't know. The button stuck like CCC. Oh, I don't know. BCF. WTC is going on here. I don't know what's going on. No one knows acronyms, I guess. All right. It was, or was it just that lame? All right. <laughs> you can't brag and show someone your high score if you get your initials wrong. You can't say, hey, see that right there? See that CCE? That's me. Yeah, right. No one's going to believe that. In fact, that's why most of the time you go to those high scores, and what are they? A, A, A. Most of the time, it's A, 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 because they can't do it either. I'm not alone. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. There is no high score swag when you have wrong letters by your score. There's no high score swag. You can't dab in front of your your high score and take a selfie. 
People are like, you're not A-A-Z, who are you? The name game is a frustrating game when you have allowed someone to define you with the wrong name. You're following me so far. There is a point to all the high scoring and the, and the Dragon Warrior. And here it is. That the name game is this frustrating game where you have allowed someone to define you with the wrong name. In video games, name matters. Yeah, chers. In life, can I tell you, name matters. When you are named in life, it feels impossible to change. Good luck living down that terrible nickname you got in high school. Good luck. In fact, if you run into those old people, chances are the first thing that's going to come out of their mouth, they are going to yell it very loudly, your terrible nickname. Yes, absolutely. People become branded by what someone else has said about them. Here's a story about my wife. My wife was told she was not a good singer. When she was young. By her family. Her family said none of us are good singers. And what someone said in passing. Without any thought. Stuck with my wife for years. And for years she would not sing publicly. Can I tell you. My wife has a good voice. And I love to hear her sing unto the Lord. It took a lot to get her to a place. Where she thought she could sing in front of people. Because what someone carelessly named her as. Names are not easy to get rid of. Be careful what you call your kids. What you name someone matters. And what you name someone defines them. Hey stupid. Hey ugly. Hey loser. These awful names are tame compared to some of the things young people call each other on social media. Can we talk about it for a moment? What people call each other on social media, what people call each other over text. Don't you ever call someone a gutter word. Do you know what I mean by a gutter word? Words that belong in the gutter should never be spoken over people. Do I need to spell it out for you? Because people spell it out all the time on Facebook, S. L-U-T, gutter word. B-I-T-C-H, gutter word. The N-word, do I need to go further? These words, people just pass them out like they don't matter. There are people that call each other these words for fun. It's naming, and it matters, and it defines. Number one, can I tell you, don't let gutter words in your mouth. The Bible tells us about this. The Bible tells us that what comes from your heart comes from where? Sorry. What comes from your mouth comes from where? There it is. Spoiler alert. What comes from your mouth comes from your heart. That's Luke 6, 45. A trashy mouth reveals a trashy heart. Don't you dare have praise for God in your mouth one moment and gutter trash in your mouth the next moment. The Bible tells us that in James chapter 3. Is that okay? Do we believe that still today? Is that just old-fashioned stuff or is that the truth? Some of us do. James chapter 3 verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. And with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. With the same tongue we praise God with words. And with the same tongue we curse other human beings who God made in His likeness. Verse 10. Out of the same mouth. Come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Verse 11, for both fresh water and salt water can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring. Don't let gutter words in your mouth. If you're going to worship God and praise God, have those kind of words in your mouth. Do not let gutter words words in your mouth. Number two, you ought to care enough for people to not put damaging labels and names on them. 
Yeah. Don't you understand that what you call someone matters? Long after you forgot what you said, they will remember how you defined them. And let me tell you, a text message is just as bad as you saying it loud with your tongue. Don't you dare do it. Don't you dare do it. I'm telling you, that's a real problem in our world today. Names define. And things that you said when you were frustrated, things that you said when you're angry, remain behind you long after you've calmed down and you've gotten over your problem. When you call, what you call your spouse when you're angry can ruin your marriage. What you call your mom and dad when they tell you no, oh heaven forbid, a parent told you no. What you tell them, when, what you call them when they tell you no, it can harm a relationship. You better watch what you're saying and you better care enough for people to not put dirty gutter words on people. Don't you dare do it. If you love that person, then gutter trash should not flow from your heart and out of your mouth towards them. Can I get an amen in the house of the Lord? I still don't think you're on team. Let's not curse at people. God gets frustrated with us, but has He ever called you a loser? God has never called you filthy names. God calls you great things. You know what He calls you? The Bible says He calls you out of darkness. It says that He calls you more than a conqueror. It says that He calls you victor. It says that He calls you powerful. That He calls you strong. That He calls you wise. That He calls you faithful. That He calls you beautiful. That He calls you treasure. That He calls you son. He calls you daughter. He calls you His beloved. What God says about you, even though you frustrate, you know you frustrate God, right? Me too. We frustrate him. But he never opens his mouth and lets gutter words fall out on us because his heart towards us is not gutter trash. It is beautiful, his heart towards us. The name game is frustrating. It's a frustrating game where you have allowed someone to define you with the wrong name. Can I remind you, names matter. Names define so here's a warning for you. Beware the namer. Look at somebody in the nerdiest voice you can. Push up your glasses and say, beware the namer. Beware the namer. This is some good information. You listen to it. Beware the namer who is frustrated. You don't want them to name you and it come out of their frustration. Beware the namer who is far away with distraction. They could be in the room with you, but their heart and mind is someone else, somewhere else. Beware that namer. Beware the namer who is more focused on their own future than your future. If you don't care about my future, then I prefer you don't try to define me. Does that make sense? Beware the namer who is frustrated. Beware the namer who is far away with distraction. And beware the namer who is not focused on you at all. Somebody say, beware the namer. Beware the namer. There is a sad character in the Bible. See, we finally got there. We got to the Bible. There is a sad character in the Bible named Rachel. Wave your hand if you know anything about the story of Rachel. All right, good. I'm, somebody's going to learn something about the story of Rachel today. She has more bad moments, it seemed, than good moments when you study her life. Her name was Rachel, and it means sheep. Before we understand Rachel, we need to understand her husband. Somebody shout out the name of her husband. I'll do it. Jacob. Somewhere a Sunday school teacher's crying, guys. <laughs> Rachel's husband was... Jacob, all right, say it loud and strong, all right, so let's learn about Jacob. Abraham had a son named Isaac, he was to be the heir of promise, his children were going to be a great nation, out of his family line would come the Messiah, the Savior, name the Savior and Messiah, what's his name? Jesus, Jesus Christ, glad you know that one, all right, good. Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Isaac has two sons, the names of his sons are? 
Jacob and Esau. Esau. And they were twins that wrestled in the womb. The first baby born was named Esau, and the word means hairy. Terrible name. <laughs> well, he's, he's hairy. Let's call him Harry. There it is. Uh, he was a hairy baby. And, and then Jacob was born with his hand around Esau's heel, appearing to be trying to be the firstborn, like they were wrestling, like he was attempting to be the firstborn. They named the second baby Jacob, which meant supplanter, one who trips others up, like grabbing them by the heel so that they would fall is the, the, the language, uh, little entomology there. Uh, it also could mean a deceiver. That's the name Jacob. Jacob, one who trips others up. Now, it's a long story, but through deceptive trickery, Jacob becomes the holder of the birthright promise, even though he is the second child born. He also, he has also made, uh, he made his older, larger, stronger, and smellier brother Esau very angry. And now we see Jacob running for his life. While running for his life, he runs into a woman that is the most beautiful woman he ever saw. Her name was Rachel, one of the funniest verses in the Bible. This is how uh, my dating with Sarah went. It went like this. It says this, he kissed her and then wept loudly. (laughs) I just think that's really hilarious. I'm the only one. All right. He finds, Jacob finds... Rachel, all right. Jacob offers Rachel's father, his name's Laban, seven years of work for him to be able to return and have the hand of Rachel as his bride. You understand this? Laban, I will work seven years for you in order for me to marry your daughter, Rachel. And he agrees to it and start the clock seven years later. Seven years later, this seemed like the most promising situation for Rachel. She was going to marry a man of promise and a man who loved her enough to commit seven years of his life in servitude. She is going to be the mother of a nation. She's going to be part of the promised Messiah. She is going to be blessed and wealthy. But life can be unfair. Life doesn't always turn out. Like you plan, it's going to turn out. After serving seven years for Rachel's hand, Laban tricks Jacob into marrying the wrong girl. Marries the wrong girl. It's unthinkable. But Jacob accidentally marries Rachel's less attractive sister, Leah. That's how it describes her, y'all. Less attractive. Leah. Everyone said Leah. It turns out that then he had to work seven more years. He had to go back to Laban and say, All right, I'm married to Leah. I will work seven more years for the hand of Rachel. This is a frustrating situation. How do you think Rachel felt right now? The happy ever ending that she imagined turned out to not be there turned out to be for her sister it turned out that she would have to wait and she would have to be second in line it turns out that Rachel could not have children and while she couldn't have children Leah gave Jacob 10 children 10 of them I think that was 10 I lost count this was unfair how do you think she felt about this Frustrated at the trick that Laban pulled on her and Jacob. But now she wants to give children to Jacob. But she can't give any children. And Leah, who's not supposed to be there, has given him ten children. She was meant to be the mother of a great nation. And she couldn't even mother a single child. So what begins to happen? A tension begins to grow between Rachel and Leah. And Rachel is no longer sure 
that she's Jacob's love any longer. This is a sad story. There's one brief moment of light here. She prays to the Lord. And she says, God, give me a son. And God gives her a son. That son's name was Joseph. Tech booth got it. Joseph was that son. A very bright spot in Rachel's life. Then she has another son. Oh, this is good. Except there were complications in the delivery of that baby. Let's read about it. Genesis chapter 5, 35, verse 16. Genesis 35, 16. Reading through 18. Look at this. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. Verse 17. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, for you have another son. Verse 18. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni. Somebody said Benoni. Look at somebody say, Beware the namer. Look at them. Say it. Beware the namer. Beware the namer who is frustrated. Oh, the frustration that Rachel felt. She felt constantly cheated. Beware the namer who is far away with distraction. Could it be that Rachel was not rejoicing in her final moments? She was distracted from the beauty of giving her husband that twelfth child, perhaps regretting the fact that she would never give her husband as many sons as Leah did. Beware those that are frustrated trying to name you. Beware the namer who is far away with distraction. And beware the namer who is more focused on their future than your future. Rachel, were you more focused on your lack of a future than the future of your son? I think she was. Beware the namer. Benoni, the name Benoni. Somebody said Benoni. Benoni. It means son of my sorrow. Talk about heavy. It's a pretty heavy name to, to put on a child. With her final breath, she says, that child is the son of my sorrow. I want to remind you that names matter. I want to remind you that what you speak over someone defines them. With her final breath, she was defining that her entire life was sorrowful and that it ends right here with only regret, fear, pain, and sorrow. But what is so terrible is that by the naming of Benoni, Rachel was not just defining her perceived reality. She was also defining the future of the baby. Does this make sense? Rachel, you aren't just defining the crumminess of your experience. The, the terrible nature of how things are right now. You're actually defining the future of this baby. This was Benoni, the son of sorrow, the baby who killed his mother in childbirth. He was to be the culmination of all her sorrow. That's what his name means. I want to remind you one more time, names matter. Names define. Beware the namer who defines you from their frustration. Beware the namer who defines you when they are distracted from the truth. And beware the namer who is more focused on their future than your future. You don't let somebody like that name you. You turn around, you stop listening, and you walk away. Rachel was frustrated by life, so she named the baby. What'd she name him? Benoni. Benoni. Have you let someone name you? Have you let someone define you out of their frustration? Oh man, parents, brothers and sisters, friends, sometimes when we're frustrated, we say things. As soon as we say them, whoa, why did I say that? But once it's out, it's out. It reveals what was in our heart. 
And the closer someone is, the greater the sting is when they name you. The, the closer someone, a parent, a brother, sister, a close friend, someone you really trust, when they say what they say, it hurts with a greater sting than just the person you're driving by at, on 75. My goodness, we've all been called names on 75, amen? All of us have been called names on 75. Some of y'all have called me names on 75. I forgive you. You can forgive somebody that you don't even know on 75, but man, people go years of their life trying to forgive their parents. Trying to forgive somebody that should have never said such a thing about them. Naming you a loser, a failure, worthless, ugly, untalented. Beware the frustrated namer. Rachel was far away distracted from the truth that she was heir to the promise. You've got this unbelievable truth, Rachel. She's totally distracted from it. She is as far away from that truth as anything. The very promise God had given to Abraham, it's yours, Rachel. She can't see it. She's too distracted to remember that God had answered her prayer and given her Joseph. And that God had answered her prayer and now given her a second son when it seemed like she could never have children. Sorrow, what are you talking about? This baby, Benoni, is an answer to prayer. She can't see it. She's far away, distracted. Have you let someone name you and define you that was distracted from truth? Mom and dad, the truth is that the child that you have is a gift from God. And unfortunately, we are so easily distracted from that truth. My goodness, preaching to myself. Don't be distracted by the bad news about your job and lose sight of the miracle in your home. Don't be distracted by your current health situation and then define yourself, well, God's just given up on me. Beware the faraway distracted namer. And then here, Rachel was focused on her immediate future when she was about to die. Oh my goodness, you will make the worst decisions in life if you're only focused on the immediate future. There are divorces that happen because someone focused on the immediate argument and it blew up. What if they would have focused on, no, this is a person I want to spend the rest of my life with and this is just a small bump in the road. Yeah. It would be completely different. But where someone that's focused on the immediate future and Rachel, she's focused on her immediate future and what is it? That she is about to die. Rachel then defined her son with her future. She defined this boy with her situation. She took her emotion and named the child with her emotion. Have you let someone with no future tell you that you have no future? Have you let someone who has failed tell you that you shouldn't even try because you're going to fail? Have you let someone who is depressed tell you your symptoms? Beware the namer who is focused only on their future, but where the name are. It's hard to change a name. Once someone names you, it's very difficult to change the defining features. A, new, a few chapters before this event, the event of Rachel's death, this very sad moment, before this moment of the baby's birth, Jacob, everyone said Jacob, Jacob. he had a face-to-face Encounter with God. It's one of the weirdest encounters of, with God in the whole Bible. Jacob ends up doing what with God? Wrestling, Wrestling with God. Wrestling. Yeah. Wrestlemania. Right there with God. In, on a biblical scale, absolutely. In this encounter, God changes Jacob's name. He changes his name. What does he change Jacob's name to? Israel. Israel. He would no longer be Jacob the supplanter, the deceiver, the one who trips people up. God gave him the new name, Israel. Do you know what that name means? The name Israel means one who struggles, who wrestles with God and triumphs with God. Israel, he's triumphant with God. The father changed his name. 
The Father redefined him. The Father gave him a brand new future. At a time when he thought it was all over, God gave him a brand new future. It was like he was born again. He was not stuck with the label someone else gave him because God gave him a brand new identity. And that identity is still flowing through his lineage because you still call it Israel to this day. Can I tell you the Father can rename you? Am I speaking to anyone that is in need of a name change? Is anyone in here... uh, need God to give them a brand new hope and a brand new future. The Father won't stand by and let you go through life with the wrong name. I know you've got these things in your past, but God is wrestling with you today to get you to let go of the past and embrace a brand new name. Check out what Israel does when he's at the bad scene in Genesis 35. His wife has just died. There is this baby. What does he do? Let's look at it. Verse 18, Genesis 35. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni. Somebody read these next words with me. But his father named him Benjamin. Say it one more time. But his father named him Benjamin. Oh, This father right here said, no way. I don't care if it's her last breath. I don't care if this is what she thinks he ought to be called. This baby is not Benoni. This baby is not son of my sorrows. This baby is Benjamin. The name Benjamin means son of my strength. Son of my right hand. His name is Benjamin. He's got a brand new future. He's got a brand new identity. All the labels have been taken off of him. And who did it? His father did it. The father won't stand by and let you have the wrong name. Son of sorrow was not the right name. I can prove it to you. I can show you how it's not. The father wouldn't let that child be called sorrow For the rest of his life. The father made sure the child was called strength. For the rest of his life. In the book of Revelation chapter 21. It tells us about heaven. And in heaven how many gates are there to the city of New Jerusalem? There are twelve. And they are named for what? One each for the tribes of Israel. Israel, Revelation 21, 12, with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates, on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. When we get to heaven, we are going to look up at a gate. And that gate is going to say, Benjamin. That gate is... It's not going to say, Benoni. No, you listen to me. There will be a gate that says, Benjamin. Oh, but he was called Benoni on earth. What some might have named the child on earth is going to be over and done. And what the father names the child is what's going to be on display for the rest of eternity. You listen to me. I don't know what somebody's called you. I don't know the awful thing that someone said about you. But the Father has a way of putting that away and putting a new name displayed for everyone to see for the rest of eternity. What somebody called you on this earth is not going to make it to heaven. Do you understand the terrible things that people called you? They're not going to exist in heaven. You're not going to remember those things in heaven. You're going to be blown away by what God calls you and what God thinks about you and what God declares over you. So do you need a name change? The name game is a frustrating game where you have allowed someone to define you with the wrong name. Are you ready to stop playing The name game. Have you been answering to the wrong name? Some of you have been answering to the wrong thing. 
Loser, oh, that's me. Failure, that's me. Sinner, that's me. Drop out, oh, that's me. I'm so ashamed. Drug addict, that's me. Divorced, oh, I hate that. That's all. Hypocrite, unhealthy, in debt, joke, unwanted, unloved, weak, stupid. Some of you have been answering to that name for far too long. Let the Father rename you. The Father wants to rename you. Does that sound like something you would like? Stop going through life with the wrong name. Tris. I would hate it if I was called Tris for the rest of my life. No, y'all don't get any ideas. In Revelation, it says that God will give those that overcome, He's going to give them a lot of things. But if one, um, one of those things He's going to give them, He's going to give them a new name. Yeah. Revelation 21, 17. Revelation 3, 12. He gives them a new name. There's one place where He takes His name and He writes it in their forehead. Isaiah 43 and 1 says that God has called you by name. He calls you by name and that you belong to him. You know what you do in grade school? Everybody's getting ready to go back to school. One of the first things you do is you get all your school belongings that you buy and you put your name on it, write your name and everything because if your name's not on it, it doesn't belong to you. God took some kind of Holy Spirit supernatural sharpie and he is going to go and he is going to write his name upon you. Why? Because you belong to Him. Because that's the name that defines you. When you are baptized, we declare the name of Jesus over you. We baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And we tell you that when you come out of the water, you are a brand new person. And let me add this to it. You have a brand new name. You are called by His name, the Bible says. God has written your name down in the Lamb's book of life. What do you think He wrote there? You think He wrote loser for you? Do you think He wrote in that book ugly? For, what I want you to imagine... The worst thing someone said to you. And try to imagine your father in heaven writing down that thing in the Lamb's book of life to describe you. You can't. He wrote your name down there. He wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life. Not the thing that, defined, that, that you have let someone else define you with. God wrote your name. Let me tell you this. He didn't write Benoni. In the Lamb's book of life. He wrote Benjamin. Who you truly are is written in the book. And God has not gotten your name wrong. As I'm drawn to a close. I want to challenge you with this. Rename someone. Look at somebody say rename somebody. Rename somebody. Don't you dare name Benjamin Benoni. Don't you dare name someone who is loved by God. Don't you dare name them with a trashy name. Don't you dare do it. In fact, like Israel, like Jacob, you should call people by the name that God has for them. You are beloved. And the person that you have the biggest beef with, they're also beloved. You are treasured. And guess what? The person you can't stand and you're worried about, you're mad about, they're also treasured. You are strong and victorious. Guess what? The person that you are just angry about right now, they feel the same way. God feels the same way about them. He says that you're victorious and able to do all things through Christ. Don't you understand that that's what he says about you? Don't you understand that that is the truth that he has for the other person? Don't you dare call them something less than what God calls them. I refuse to call you Benoni. I refuse to call you quitter. 
I refuse to call you loser. God wants Redemption Church to be a place where people receive a new name. Amen. God wants Redemption Church to be a place where somebody walks in through the door and all their past is forgotten about. God wants Redemption Church to be a place where somebody realizes that they're loved by God, and that's truly what defines them, not what someone has said about them. Jacob had a face-to-face encounter with God, and his name changed forever. Do you want to have a face-to-face encounter with God? Do you believe that He can change your life forever? I would love it if someone today stopped letting something in their past to define them. If someone would let that just go away, that they would stop playing the name game, that they would stop being called what their mom said about them, what their dad said about them, what their brother and sister said about them. I want to challenge you today, if that's you, I want you to come to this altar. I want you to come in the first two feet. And when we come to pray with you today, I want you to tell us that you want a new identity, that you want a new, you want a new name in Jesus Christ. We're going to open up these altars for a time of prayer. It's the third thing we do every time we come together. We talk to God. These altars are open right now. If you need special prayer, come into the first two feet. We love you. We love you, you're beloved of God. We love you, and you've got a future. We love you, and we don't love you even as much as God loves you. He loves you so much. He gave His only Son for you. He he trusts you. He, He wants to fill you with His Spirit. He wants to give you power. He wants to give you authority. He wants to put His name on you. Come on, Redemption Church, let's talk to God. Let's reach out to God in this place. Some of you know somebody that has been going through something where they have been defined by something that's not true. Why don't you come and pray for them in this altar? Come on, let's pray and let's talk to God. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for not letting me stay Benoni. Thank you for renaming me. Thank you for not letting me be named according to what people on earth have named me. I thank you for the truth and I thank you for the love and I thank you for the spirit. I thank you for the destiny that you've given me, God. That is what is true and I receive it, Father, in Jesus' name. Let us be people that aren't filled with gutter trash, but let us be people that have love in our heart and it flows out of us in what we say about people and what we call people in the name of Jesus. I pray for our homes. God, our homes would be filled with that kind of speech. That our hearts would be overflowing with love for each other. Even when we're frustrated. Even when we're distracted. God, Lord, let your love be present. Let it be shining. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550. Thank you for joining us, and have a blessed day.